Alright, man. Shit. Alright, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll see you in about an hour. <laughs> Something about that boy ain't right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> just had to make sure that went on the YouTube stream and sounded all right, which it does, and it did, and voila, we are live and on the air, so welcome everyone to the Foolish Tech Show. It is a wonderful Monday morning. And hopefully everyone out there got more sleep than I did. But we are here and ready to provide support and answer any questions about your our products or services, if you have any of those first and foremost. If not, we're uh, going to take it a little bit different today. We kind of have a focus theme, and uh, we're going to spend some time on it. Um, Today I have a couple of things to show you on uh, the Wi-Fi Pineapple Tetra. I'm seeing if I can get all these cords so I can actually show it off here. Yeah, there we go. Close enough. So we got a uh, Wi-Fi Pineapple Tetra here, and I got a couple little things already set up for us to demo, which is why you can see I got a second monitor system over here, and that's actually my Laptop running connected, you can see it right there. And we're gonna do some little demonstrations with it. Um, I thought this would be good because uh, this is a, part of this will be a demonstration that I showed uh, Mike at Invise Solutions in uh, Utah. Um, we, uh, Johnny and I visited him uh, over the past summer and stopped by there on a trip across country and uh he was he was like not very impressed that i had a wi-fi pineapple and was thinking that everything in his network was a-okay and ready to go and super secure and my biggest thing on him was you got wireless security cameras he was like, yeah, well, they got a wired option, but I don't want to run wires everywhere. And I was like, you got wireless security cameras that have a wired option, and you're running them wirelessly? He was like, yeah, what's the problem with that? I was like, well, I mean, if you don't want them to work at all, there's no problem. No problem at all. But he was like, no, I, that's not true. My network's super secure. It's all going through my router and system setup. And he was like, he took me through, like, four locked doors to get to where his server and router setup is and then he has it in like this big case that's locked and I was like that's great man that is super great but I can bring your entire network down in like five minutes here and you won't get any kind of pictures of anything so um, he has since upgraded his uh, setup so that he's going to be using wired uh, cameras and the wired portion of the cameras so He's not going to be completely vulnerable to this. There are still a few things that we could get him on, but we're not going to get into that right now. So um, let's see what we got here. Just make sure all my stuff is set up first and foremost here. All right. So if you're interested, this is the device we're talking about. And... They do have two versions, a uh, Wi-Fi Pineapple Nano and a Wi-Fi Pineapple Tetra. This is their sixth generation of Wi-Fi Pineapples uh, made by Hack5, um, also from the show Hack5 and uh, Hack5.org. Um, they also make things like the USB Rubber Ducky, which you might have seen on a recent episode of Mr. Robot. Um, Land Turtle is pretty cool as well, and they have a few various products from other people. Highly recommend checking out their shop and things that they do. They've had, I think they're on their 20th season now, so 20 seasons of 
great shows. So um, definitely check them out. And we're talking about the Tetra here. Uh, just to give you a little bit of overview on the others and the choices you have there. The biggest difference between the Tetra and the Nano is going to be five gigahertz support. So the Tetra is one of the, actually the first generation of Pineapple that has a five gigahertz uh, wireless support. So you have the full range wireless accessibility there, but it also has uh, four built-in amplifiers and you can see the four MIMO set up antennas and I don't know all the super technical details about it but it is a pretty awesome device. It is a little bit larger. Um, you can see you saw when I lifted it up it's about the size of my hand and there is another version out there called the Nano. That one does not have the 5 gigahertz support but what it lacks in radio compatibility it makes up for in portability. Um, that thing is super small and I can actually put that one off here too just to show the difference. But this is the uh, tactical elite version here because I later upgraded the antennas but see the case it comes in much smaller than my hand. And let's see if I can actually get it up here easily. So we got the Nano there, which you can see much, much smaller, much more compact, and we'll do all of the things that we're going to show here. Um, I'm using the Tetra today because I want to show the 5 gigahertz support that it's got on here. So, sorry, my screensaver goes on. You can still see me, but I can't see it. So just want to make sure that I am connected to the five gigahertz on this one. Looks good. And um, oh, I just noticed that their Tetra Tactical Edition went with the shoulder bag instead of the backpack. Oh, that's so cool. I got a limited edition thing apparently. So. Um, Anyway, let's jump on and we'll share my screen and check out some of the stuff it can do here. All right, waiting on the stream to pick up just so I can see what's going on. All right, cool. So what we see here is the main interface for the Tetra. You can actually see mine has been up for a little over six hours now. Let's see, yeah, six hours and 33 minutes. Um, I am stacking pretty high on the CPU usage because I am already running one of the modules with some stuff going. But uh, have internet connection sharing going between this and my Tetra in my network. Um, currently the Tetra is plugged in with two Y cables to my USB 3 hub that's powered. So it has four USB plugs pulling power to power this. And the Tetra does require a little bit more um, power than the Nano does. So just keep that in mind as well. But um, one thing I did want to mention on uh, the network sharing side of things, I think I found a bug with Windows and something that's actually been quite aggravating me is proportionally problem with the bug. But so when you want to share your uh, network, go into your adapter settings and you go into properties. Have to move, nope. Cool, it showed up on the right one. You'll go into sharing and say allow sharing. This will actually be a drop down so that you can pick which network you want to set. Now, when you do that, what ends up happening here is the uh, adapter gets changed from whatever it's set at 
to a static IP. And when it's set as a static IP, it sets it as some weird like 193, whatever, whatever. That's well and fine, great. I end up having to change the static IP, so kind of upset that it doesn't give me the option, but that's not really the bug here. The bug is if you have shared this connection with one network connection, then you remove that network connection and then try to share it with another one, this is where the aggravating part comes in because Windows only allows one network adapter to have the same IP address. So you can statically assign IP addresses on network adapters, but you can't statically assign more than one uh, network adapter with the same static IP settings, even if that network adapter is not present at all on the system just stored in registry and memory bank somewhere in Windows. I haven't looked and tried to track it down. It's just kind of aggravating that they do it that way. But the issue that you'll run into is say you do have a network connection. You share the connection with that. You don't change the static IP from whatever it assigns by default. You unplug and remove that network adapter from your system. Try to share that connection with another adapter Guess what happens? Windows freaks out. It still shares the connection, but I've actually seen that when I did it, when I went into the properties of a network connection here, I actually ended up having two TCP IP4 addresses. So this was actually doubled here so that whatever the static address for that adapter was or automatically assigned was there, but then also right below it, right here, they ended up having a second IPv4 address. What happened? I don't know. I thought he was going for dramatic pause. Did you just who said what happened? I did. Oh. So uh, are you asking this? What happened here? He went silent all of a sudden for a yeah. while. <laughs> you just went, what happened? And then nothing. <laughs> so uh, anyway, what happened was Windows freaked out on me. Um, it came up and first, uh, it wouldn't share the connection properly. So I found that if you go in and assign it to automatically pull and then assign it back to static, it gives you the option to change it. But there was one point where I ended up having to restart my entire system. Your mute button sucks. Um, because uh, when I tried to share it and then switch IP addresses, then uh, it ended up hanging and giving me a com surrogate uh, crashed error. And then actually that uh, properties window would not go away. I couldn't mess with the adapters window at all. I actually had to reboot to get those windows to go away and for the network to seemingly go back to where it was. But that's actually extremely aggravating as if you're changing network adapters and sharing internet between them all. But that's a windows bug, I feel, because it Either it should be giving me the choice of what I want to statically assign that IP address as, or it should let network adapters that are not attached to the system have the same static IP address. So let's give a quick rundown for those who aren't familiar on the Wi-Fi Pineapple interface. Um, you do have a few options here. Oh, I did I just, yeah, I must have disconnected from internet. Hmm. Just not realizing. Oh, yeah, that was because I was sharing, oh, because I was clicking network stuff. Terrible idea to do in the middle of a show. <laughs> um, so Proctor was asking what happened to me. God, there we go. It's Monday morning. That's what happened. Um, 
and I didn't pray to any demo gods this morning. So anyway, uh, you have quite a few things you can do here. You can recon, survey the landscape. Uh, the Tetra, you can see you can do 2.4 and 5 gigahertz and just scan for clients and uh, networks that are out there and the clients therefore attached to those networks out there. Um, and then you can target the ones that you're interested in and do some other fun stuff with those. I'm not going to show off the scan because you'll see my neighbors networks and I don't have any control over that so um, the biggest thing that it does is called Pine AP and this is their highly customized version of uh, Karma and something else I forget exactly what it was based off of but they've done a lot of their own customization and work on it since then and essentially what this does is it takes advantage of a uh, convenience factor. Convenience versus security, always a balance. Well, in this case, convenience ends up causing problems. Um, essentially, all of your Wi-Fi devices, if you have saved networks, are always out there yelling, hey, network, are you here? Are you here? Are you here? Well, what Pine AP does is it answers back, yep, I'm here. I'm the network you're looking for. And at that point, it will uh, basically send a response back and then your Wi-Fi device will say, awesome, let me automatically try to connect to you. Um, this is where some difficulties come in with this attack, but essentially if you have a secured network that it's uh, asking for, your phone is going to send over the first two parts of the four-way handshake and say, hey, awesome, you're here. What's, what's the what's the answer to this encryption setup? And the pineapple can't emulate encryption. It doesn't know your password for your Wi-Fi, so it can't do anything about that. So you won't connect to that one. For otherwise, though, if you have, say, a open network stored, if that's yelling out, are you here, and the Wi-Fi pineapple says, yep, I'm here, you automatically connect to it. Um, so, that means that if you ever connect to an open Wi-Fi, such as Starbucks, McDonald's, uh, your public library, um, on the planes, internet, things like that, you want to make sure you go in and forget those networks as soon as you're done so that your phone's not trying to broadcast out those. Um, essentially, what will happen if you don't is this will pick you up and you won't even know that it's happening sometimes because your phone's going to be sitting in your pocket, um, say at a movie theater, and you're not looking at your phone, but your phone's still yelling out into the world, and then it connects to the Wi-Fi pineapple, and then everything it does in the background ends up being done through the Wi-Fi pineapple, which is the big selling point on this is it's a man-in-the-middle device. So things will connect to it, and you'll be able to sniff traffic and do all kinds of fun stuff like that, which is where the modules come in. And since we did do a previous show, oh man, the screen sharing's not picking up. Are y'all able to see my screen? Yeah. You see the, the Pine AP page? Or is it still on my network screen? Uh, configuration. Mac address. Hmm. Stream doesn't be, seem to be showing that. Check the other stream. I see the same thing on the stream that I see on the share. Hmm. Maybe it's just my stream doesn't seem to be showing that. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. It is showing it. All right. So uh, we had done a previous episode about the Pineapple and Nano when they first came out. Not as many modules here, but there are now quite a few modules to pick from. Um, you may recognize some tools like Auto SSH, uh, Git, NGREP, NMAP, uh, TCP dump, uh, WPS, URL snarf. 
Um, but then there's some other interesting ones like uh, signal strength and site survey. Signal strength is pretty interesting because uh, is it this one that will give me a option. Let me double check. No, it's site survey that's pretty interesting. Signal strength is interesting because it shows you the ones of it around there. But uh, site survey is interesting because it allow you to capture that four-way handshake for your encrypted uh, WPA, WPA2 encryption. And then from there, once you have that handshake captured, you can go to this module like online hash crack, submit that WPA key and uh, have this online hash place try to crack it for you. And they'll try to start cracking it and it says uh, on their site that if it goes it'll go anywhere from a couple minutes to four days and if they're able to crack it they'll send you an email notification um, they do have some pricing on there if you uh, end up with a password that's on their list already um, or something else you get it for free but if not, then they charge you, I think, like six bucks to get the wireless password. So the big thing there is capturing the handshake with the Tetra, and then you can go through and uh, try to crack it on your own if you have enough GPU power or access to enough uh, computing power to do it. Which, if you're on a targeted attack, uh, WPA2 uses um, both uh, the SSID to salt your uh, wireless password encryption. So whatever you have the name of your network as ends up being tied to what your four-way handshake and encryption stuff goes for. So to break that, you actually have to have the uh, name of it salted in there with hashes. So you can go through and build your own tables for that and then try to crack it that would probably be the better way to attack a network than trying to get one like this, unless it's in a common network name, which I think there's a list of a thousand common networks. And those will be uh, uh, easily cracked by online services like this. But if it's not an online or common SSID, then you have a much better chance of someone having to put a little bit of their own work in behind it. Um, and Nick had wanted me to bring this up before on the show that uh, your, your network name matters on your encryption stuff. So if you have a complex network name, that's better off for you because that's salting your network hashes. Also on that same point that if you change your network password, probably not a bad idea to go ahead and change your network name. I mean, you have to reconnect all your devices anyway. No reason not to just connect them to a new uh, network name. That makes it so that they have to start over from ground zero. Uh, fairly easy to capture your four-way handshake. Much more difficult to compile rainbow tables based on your uh, SSID and then further to crack the four-way handshake with that set of rainbow tables or something to that effect. So um, good knowledge and info there. But the two things I wanted to show off today are going to be the uh, deauth, and then we're going to do some of the SDR stuff. So we're going to close out of this window. And we have deauth here. So um, going to show you this and then we're going to switch back to the video scenes so that you can actually see my laptop over here uh, dropping off the network when it gets kicked off. And this is the attack that I use on penetration testing uh, might get Invise's network. And I'll go ahead and link the module page here. So uh, another thing to note about these is most all of these modules are created by the community. So the community creates modules, submits it to uh, Hack5. They look them over for anything malicious or 
targeted against the pineapple stuff and then they approve it and add it to the repository. Um, and that's where you can go to manage module and download them and use the pineapple to get all that set up. Um, so this one is actually made by Whistlemaster. He makes uh, quite a few of these modules, so kudos to him for that, or her. I guess it is him from his character there, but um, anyway. What we got here is we had to install some dependencies. We pick out which radio we want. There's actually two radio chipsets in the sixth generation Wi-Fi's um, pineapples. So we have uh, WLAN zero and WLAN one, which is actually in monitor mode. So we'll just do that one. And we can go ahead and start it. That goes off these settings here, which we can see I have it in blacklist mode. So it's only going to target the ones that I want. Um, fun thing about deauth packets is every single wireless is susceptible to this attack, which is why I laughed at Mike at Invise when he said his wireless IP cameras were secure and uninterruptible because every wireless, this is built into the wireless protocol that deauthentication packs disconnect uh, items from the wireless. So um, that gives them a chance to reconnect automatically, but it's built in, so there's no way you can protect against it. If you have wireless, you're open to this attack. And if I don't do blacklist, that means that all the wireless in my area would be going down as I was doing this. So don't want that to happen. And that's technically illegal to do it that way. And since I'm on my own network here, which I have test network set up on my wireless's guest router, or uh, guest routing, guest extension, guest networks, whatever they're called, um, I can do those and I have them specifically targeted. So it's only going to try to bring down these two networks. Uh, speed, I really don't know what this one does. I just put in 2000 because it's a high number. Um, it usually ends up getting about uh, five to 100, I think. We'll, we'll see it in the output once we switch back over to this. But uh, you can also have it start on boot and uh, you can pick which channels you want to do it on. So I have my uh, standard wireless on 2.4 gigahertz on channel six. I have my five gigahertz one on 153. You can do some scans uh, with this editor and find out a little bit more about the MAC addresses and things like that. But again, don't want to scan in my area. So not showing off my neighbors, but we can see I went ahead and added the uh, MAC addresses for those uh, two networks. And actually, I guess that's the BSS ID. Um, so that's for the 2.4 gigahertz and the five gigahertz. Then we got a uh, output here so we can actually see what's going on. And once we switch back from back to screen sharing, you'll be able to see that. But we're going to stop sharing the screen now so that we can see my extra connection here. So we see that's working. Hey, there's no latency between those. And I'm going to go ahead and push start on that. And right now it's connected to the five gigahertz. And it does take some time for things to get rolling on Dioth. So you kind of just sit back and wait on this. But uh, once it starts going, um, essentially what will end up happening on this laptop is I'll get disconnected from the network and on 
Linux Mint here, it'll actually come up and prompt me with the password box to re-enter the password. No matter what you try to do, if you try to enter the password or anything there, it's always going to fail. And even if it does connect even for a slight second, it's going to kick you right back off again. Um, I might have to stop my other module here. Oh man, there's a plane going too. All right, while we wait on that to go, we'll share my screen again, because I do have one thing that's currently happening right now. And I don't know if it'll always be there. So um, you may be able to see here that the deauth has started. We'll come back to that one. I think it's because I am running this module right now, which shucks, we missed it. There was a plane showing here, but uh, this is the dump 1090. Um, essentially what this will do is use your RTL SDR dongles. Let's see if we can get that showing here. Oh, you can't see me right now. So uh, RTL SDR dongles are super cheap, about 20 bucks will get you one and you can monitor airplanes. Oh, there we go. We got an airplane back. So you can see uh, this airplane is actually flying slightly close to my town, not over my house, but uh, it's a good five, 10 miles away from my house. So picking up an airplane flying along, you can see all the info down here, even the flight path that it's taking. But this is receive only, so it's not interfering with this. I'm not bringing down any planes. Don't freak out FAA, but if you're the FAA, I hope you already know this. So um, these are always broadcasting here and uh, showing off uh, planes position, height, altitude, uh, various details like that, speed, and you can track the planes as they go over you. We just saw that one disappeared. Um, pretty cool because I got Atlanta here. I'll have planes flying over all the time. You get the uh, tail number with it. And with that tail number, you can actually go in and Google that. Let's see if we can Google that one. And usually you'll come back with some flight aware research. And you can find out more about that plane. So we can actually see the full path where it's traveling currently and where it's going to. So this one's going all the way down to, uh, looks like Miami probably. Hey, Phil. Um, but then you can also look more into the aircraft itself. You can find out what kind it is. And there's some ways to look around and find out who owns it and all kinds of stuff like that. It looks like Detroit Metro Wayne County is where oh, it's going to Fort Lauderdale and it came from Detroit. And where is it that we can look at this one? This one maybe? That's just showing all the planes. Just looks for that model number. Maybe we get photos of the plane. Hey, we can see what it looks like. It's pretty cool. Um, there's somewhere on here that you can tell who owns it as well. And, uh, actually see the hands and stuff that that airplanes changed hand through. So that's a uh, pretty fun to check out and look at, but kind of interesting seeing things that are uh, flying overhead and information that you never knew was out there probably. So that is that one. I'm going to stop this because it's probably taking up all the CPU of this Tetra to run. And we're going to go back to our D off and try restarting it here. Let's see if we can get my other camera here to go off. All right, let's 
see if that is going. Looks right. There we go. Now it's starting to send some packets. So we should see this camera drop off here in just a few moments. Um, there are some other sides you can do. You can do whitelisting. So certain wireless networks don't go down. If you're penetration testing in an area where there's a important wireless and you only want to test one of them, you have the ability to stop that. Um, but the blacklist one, it's going to target just those. And that's what we're looking for. Uh, looks like it is starting, but this does take some time sometimes. Um, essentially, what it's going for is just sending out a bunch of deauth packets to these networks and will eventually disconnect this one, I hope here. Pray to the demo gods. And it seems to be going a bit slow still, so I may end up having to reboot it. I've been running that dump 1090 for hours on end, so it might have uh, caused some issue or slow down. But we'll give it a minute here. Uh, while we wait on that, this the dump 1090, this is the link for that one. And it is uh, also made by Whistlemaster. So that's some pretty awesome modules. Um, does seem to be going pretty slow. So I'm gonna try restarting here just to make sure everything is cleared out and we're focused on this one. Um, when I was doing it with uh, market buys, basically I had the nano out and uh, first time I'd actually done this penetration test and it took me a little bit to make sure that it was running and everything was going right and that I had things configured correctly. Um, once I did that, I was like, it's sending packets, man. It is everything will stop. And he was like, oh, I'm sure it will. And I was like, well, everything will stop on your network, not everybody else's network that we can see here. And he had his Amazon Echo playing music and blasting away there. And that's running off Wi-Fi. And uh, I was like, just wait, just wait. You wait and your Amazon Echo will stop playing music and you won't be able to access your wireless cameras anymore. And sure enough, a couple minutes went by and his uh, Amazon Echo stopped playing music. And I was like, hey, hey, check on your wireless cameras there. And he was like, oh, I can't, I can't get to them. They're down. And then he complained to me because uh, he was not able to get to his, uh, he was saying that he had all kinds of things that he ended up having to go back and like power down and then power back on and have it try to reconnect. But he had a couple things that, uh, had some issues getting back up and running afterwards, which I'm pretty sure as issues, he just meant that he had to unplug it and then plug it back up. So it forced a redetection and network and reconnected. All right, waiting on this to start up. Should almost be there. While we wait on that, I'll show the RTL and this actually not gonna be able to see it there because my green screen. Let me show you on this one. Um, this one actually has a flight aware uh, filter on it so that it uh, filters just the 1090 megahertz, which that stuff is being broadcasted on. And then I have a completely unsized uh, antenna right there. 
I had this fully extended all the way because it seems to pick up better. But you can like properly size antennas and there's like a whole antenna theory that you can try to figure out that uh, makes it much better to pick up those things. Um, Hack5 did an awesome segment on it where they actually built their own antenna and were able to see like 500 plus miles away for flights. Um, with just this antenna and setup I have, I can get maybe about 50 miles out. Um, and that's sometimes pushing it. But All right, looks like this is back up and running. Let me get my DAUTH back up and running as well. I'm basically just setting those same settings we had. Looks like those are saved and those are saved also. Awesome. So we are just going to start it up here again. And hopefully we should see this one end up going off here in just a second. It's getting warmed up there, so we'll let it warm up here. Um, while we wait on that, let's see what else we got. Pause that. Not sharing my screen so I can check the other stuff. Um, I hope that's the one I want. Not the only one I want. All right, still waiting on it to pick up and start away there. Like I said, with his, I just kind of set it and forget it. So let's see if we got some other news and such going on out in the world. Um. Oh, I thought this was pretty funny. Uh, this is Kylo Ren reacts to the new Rogue One trailer. Um, if you like Star Wars, then you might like that. He is not in the new Rogue One, so it's way before his time. But it's pretty funny uh, watching it, I thought. Watching him react to it is it's kind of funny. If you like Star Wars, don't like don't look at it if you don't like Star Wars. No point. Um, still waiting on that to start. So otherwise, uh, American Horror Story is coming out with their sixth season, September fourteenth. So. Actually, a lot of good shows are starting up here. Um, that one, uh, more notably, uh, season two of, uh, oh, what was that Chainsaw Guy's name? The show with that Chainsaw Hand Guy. Uh, blanking on the name. Ash versus Evil that's the one. Thank you, Tank. Um, Ash vs. Evil Dead uh, TV show is in the second season. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be at uh, the Comic-Con in San Diego, I think it was, then you got to see the first episode of the second season already. If not, or if you were, shame on you for not recording it and posting it to the internet. Even a low-quality version would have been nice to see. But uh, since they had not happened, we'll get to see the second season coming up in October, I think. So same for Walking Dead. And actually, Fear the Walking Dead just picked up its mid-season uh, shut off. And it's actually doing much, much better than it had been for the past season and a half there. 
Um, so it is broadcasting packets here, but I'm not seeing it deauth yet. So I guess we'll go ahead and switch our screen and go to the last one while we wait on that to deauth. And if we see it deauth, then I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll switch back over. You'll see this camera's dead. We'll reconnect that one and try connecting to the other one. But let's go ahead and share my screen for this last one. And this last one is actually a fairly new addition to the uh, modules section here. Um, waiting for the screen to pick up just so I can see it on the session. Let's get there. So you can see it's sending out uh, packets here and it's showing disconnections between some things, but it's not the system yet. So not worried about that yet. Um, it'll just sit here and beacon out packets over, packets over and over and over again. And otherwise, this is the one that I'm more excited about. Uh, this is the newly released HackRF module. And this is from the creator of the most awesome random role module which basically what this does is if you happen to get picked up by Pine AP or uh, another man in the middle attack that the Wi-Fi Pine Elf will offers, you will be shown a uh, random uh, page here, uh, basically Rick Ashling you. As you can see the Rick roll here, which root of the name, random roll. We'll show you one of these awesome internet memes for any site that you try to go to while the pineapple is in the man in the middle there. And that one was made by Foxtrot. He also made this HackRF module here. And let me link to those before we get too far off here. Here's that one, that's the random rule. And this one is the HackRF. So we got those two, and as you can see there, uh, kind of simple for what it can do. Um, brand new, so there may be some new features coming, but basically what happens here is, this is my HackRF and a Porta Pack, which you're not gonna be able to see because I'm sharing my screen. Um, it's connected to the uh, Wi-Fi Pineapple Tetra here via the USB port. And then you can see that it is detected here. Um, he did have to go through and compile the HackRF tools to uh, make it so that OpenWRT can recognize HackRF and use it and interface with it. Um, I think that was probably the biggest challenge there. And then he made this module so that you can do some uh, capturing of receive and actually do some transmitting. So you actually have the ability to do some uh, replay attacks with this. And one sec here. So essentially what we can do here is we can define our sample rate. The Tetra does pretty good with the 20 million samples. That's uh, the recommended or highest or something to that effect. But more samples means uh, better quality, I believe. But forgive me, I'm a complete noob on all of these things still. I kind of just do this in my side for fun. But then you can choose your frequency. Um, he actually made it a point to call me out on that's how you're supposed to type it because I was typing it in like that and saying it wasn't working for him, but he actually made it so that's working. So awesome, thanks you for that, Foxtrot. Um, then you can choose if you're receiving. To receive, we wanna start off receiving here first. And I think we can just get away with one megahertz on my DC spike. And then you set where you want it to capture to. Pick that one. You can set your gains and antenna power. 
and we're going to set these two just for fun because I'm not actually going to be able to replay what I'm going to capture here. But basically what I have is a uh, key fob for a car. And I know it's set on 315 megahertz. And what you can do there is we'll go ahead and start. I have it offset because uh, SDRs have a DC spike. So the power that it's receiving actually shows up in the SDR uh, graph display spectrum, whatever it's called. So the the frequency that you're targeting can't be the exact frequency. You kind of have to offset it a little bit so that it can pick up the actual signal you're looking for and not include that DC spike in there. So I'm just going to do it on this one because I know it's not going to work, but I know my key fob is at 315 megahertz. So if we start that, we'll see down here that it starts rolling away and picking things up. And if I just press this a couple times, it's picked up the signal almost positively. But then we can stop it and then replay that back with the transmission version. And try sticking this up just to see if this works, because that might be fun if it does. But then we can just go and oh, we have the option to repeat the transmission over and over again and transmission gain even. So let's go ahead and do those. And we'll go ahead and start. And of course, my car isn't locking itself again because that's not how most modern key fobs work. Um, essentially, those are usually use a rolling code. So as soon as I hit lock here, that code's been used up. So it can't be used for a replay attack like this. But you can kind of get the idea. Um, with that captured file, though, you can also open up an introspectrum. I think it's a Linux program, so I can't show it off on these systems. But um, basically, you can use that to look at the file that you captured. And you can also do some other things and things like that. Again, just a hobby for me. I haven't really got all of the understanding of it. But pretty awesome that you can do that here. Um, replay attacks just straight probably are going to be best against uh, simple things that wouldn't be uh, using rolling codes, which most of your garage doors even now are using rolling codes. Um, majority of all your car key fabs are going to be using rolling codes as well. But uh, things like uh, wireless doorbells, um, wireless lights. Um, my grandparents are very fond of the remote controls for the lights and ceiling fan things, those could be easily uh, have a replay attack against. If you want to turn the lights off and the fans off with this, you could do that. And uh, just be careful because transmitting, you do want to have a uh, ham operator's license for so that you can be aware of all the things that go into transmitting. Um, there's, uh, it's fairly illegal to jam things, which could also be done this route, where you're jamming a frequency. That's highly illegal. Don't do it. But having a ham operator's license, you'll know more about those things and understand how they work and things of that nature. Um, looks like we're sending off a bunch of deauth packets, but does not look like this one is deauthing here. So let's try stopping it. These may be on automatic channels, so they might have switched over the night. So we're going to try taking that off. And let's try just starting it again on that. Let's see if my de thing will start here. 
So we'll go back to this one so we can see when that one actually goes down. But while we do that, I'll show off the HackRF and how I had it connected here. So this is the HackRF. It's actually in a port pack right now, which actually gives you the ability to see spectrum and do some receive and transmission and uh, record some other interesting things like uh, tire pressure and utility gauges and boats and stuff like that, all in this uh, nice little screen here. But right now I have it actually turned into HackRF mode, so it's not using this port pack part, it's just using the baseboard below, and that's connected with a USB. I did want to try to show off here, if we can get it up here, the fact that I actually had the USB port on the Tetra, which you can barely show off there, um, is actually going through a extender first off so that this hub would fit, but then it's just going into a cheap little non-powered hub. So I have an extender connecting to the USB port and then a four port hub, and that is running the, or it was running the HackRF and the RTL dongle with no issues at all. So thought that was fun and cool. And it's not look like we're getting D off here. That sucks. That's the one thing that I did want to show off and was the coolest. But that's what happens with demo gods. Let's try it one more time here. Still running there. So that's still running. Let's give it a chance to warm up here. And while we do that, let's just look if there's any other interesting news going on out there today. Um, nothing right off the bat. I don't have the link for it, but that uh, probe that they sent to Jupiter just made the closest approach of anything to Jupiter. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, it's got nine instruments that it's checking with, and uh, everything is looking good on that. I think they're going to do like 32 passes and then end up uh, crashing it into the Earth. Or crashing it into Jupiter like they did a different one. I forget what the name of it is. Michael would probably be able to tell you both of those. The Juno probe? Yeah, that's the first one. Or that's the one that they're doing right now. But then they had a previous probe that I think it was Galileo possibly that they crashed into the um, crashed into Jupiter already. And it had previously done the closest flyby at like 25,000 uh, kilometers or miles away. But uh, this one's doing uh, much, much closer uh, hits and attacks on it. So, all right, I switched over to the 2.4G. So let's see if we're getting better DOS on that. And I really started off with this one because I wanted to see this one work the most. But trust me, it does. It's just the demo gods are not friendly on Monday mornings, apparently. Or maybe they just don't want to show this off at all. They're fickle, fickle beast. Let it run for a little bit here. Um, see what else we got going on today. Still going. Uh, 
Packets are going mighty slow. Let's see if it picks up here. If not, we're going to try powering down and powering back up since we have to wait on Michael to get back to shut down the stream anyway. Oh, here's a fun Slashdot article. How are security experts protecting their own data? Um, I'm going to go ahead and link this Slashdot one here because I am almost positive the comments will be better than whatever the um, actual article has to say. That usually is on Slashdot with those kind of articles. And you only need that part of the link. You don't need all that UTM stuff. Um, the Electronic Foundation or Electronic Freedom Foundation's chief technologist revealed that he doesn't run an antivirus program, partly because he's using Linux and partly because he feels antivirus, antivirus software creates a false sense of security. Um, I was actually kind of the same way all the way up until Windows 10 where Defender is built into it. They're essentially taking Microsoft security essentials and upgraded it to uh, latest and greatest with the anniversary update. That's all that I run as antivirus on my system. Um, as we've mentioned before in our ransomware testing and virus testing stuff for crypto prevent, that's actually something that we end up having to turn off quite often because on our virtual machines even, it picks up the ransomware, or malware, a virus that we're testing at the time and quarantines and stops it from us even being able to use it, which is incredibly aggravating if you're trying to test out that or trying to test out other protections against it. Um, so that's something we normally have to turn off. So kudos Microsoft on actually taking responsibility for your OS and trying to protect it. Um, finally, you did such a great job with uh, Security Essentials when it first came out that I would have thought you would have continued that trend and not gave up on it on Windows 8 and then come back to it on Windows 10. Yeah, who knows? You're doing a great job, though. Keep it up make it better even better maybe you'll finally get people to stop running norton and mcafee and other things which are already taking up more ram than windows does sometimes now so um shocks man i really wish it would de off me here Making sure I'm not auto connecting to another network. Nope. Um, DL thing does take some patience sometimes. Like I probably could have just left it running at the beginning and it would have done much better. But since it's not, we don't have Michael back yet. Let's throw a shout out to Michael because we are on our hour. And while we wait on that, I'll just power this down. Does anybody else have anything they want to talk about or share? Anything of that nature. Uh, power down, try restart. Lost in code, man. Did you? Yay! Know? That's a good place for you to be. Yay! Michael's back now, so we Did can you need to start it. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it would be preferable. Hopefully, it's not starting. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we'll go ahead and stop today. I'll. I can't believe the. The demo guys beat me like that, but um, DAUTH does work, and Mike at Envise will also uh, uh, claim that as well. But otherwise, uh, 
hope you liked seeing some of the Wi-Fi pineapple stuff. We'll be back tomorrow. Again, we are here to provide uh, support and answer any questions for our products and services. Um, we are going to start on Mondays doing some stuff like this since we don't always have very much uh, chitter chatter going on in the chat. Um, we're going to try to go back to our roots where we had a full segment topic on something of technology interest in particular and try to do a whole show on that. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that and we'll be back tomorrow uh, probably picking up with our random recent news and things like that. And yeah, hope you have a good start to your week. Thank you for the show, Brantley. That was awesome. And yeah, it was, was a good show. Right now, but <clears throat> I was I enjoyed hearing it, and I'll be looking at it later again, just for info. Yeah, going back to the YouTube. That's where it's for. So, um, no problem. I was glad we got it. I wish the demo gods had been a little bit nicer, but uh, yeah. the other two things worked out. So that's what that was the more important stuff. But you know, maybe we can to be continued, or or perhaps you could um, just finish up recording. Um, yeah, I'll have to figure out if I can. Because having this set up, like, this is what I didn't get to test was having this. Uh, so I had the meeting connection. Like, last night, I didn't have anything running on this one. It was just connected to the wireless. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Anyway, we'll, we'll look more into it. Maybe we'll do another segment. Like you saw, there's a ton of modules. We can look into that. Plus, there's some other stuff that we can play around with. So um, anyway... Start the week, guys. Happy Monday. Yeah. Take us on out. Take care. Michael. Yeah.